I said, are you ready? All right, you can be seated. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. A man and his never, never uh, ever, rather, a man and his ever nagging wife went on vacation to Jerusalem. While they were there, the wife passed away. The undertaker told the husband, you can have her shipped home for $5,000. Or you can bury her here in Jerusalem for $150. The man thought about it and told him he would just have her shipped home. The undertaker said, why would you spend $5,000 to ship your wife home? When it would be wonderful to be buried here in Jerusalem and you would only spend $150. The man replied, Long ago, a man died here, was buried here, and three days later, he rose from the dead. I just can't take the chance. A woman noticed her husband standing on the bathroom scale, sucking in his stomach. Ha, she said. That's not going to help. Sure it does, he said. It's the only way I can see the numbers. <laughs> I have a few things I want to show you on the screen. I um, think they're pretty neat. Be honest, Mr. Jobs, the last time an apple caused so much excitement around here involved Adam, Eve, and a snake. Mr. Jobs, apple, hello. It's pretty bad when you have to describe a a, a cartoon to you. Let's do the next one. Then God said, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is the apple has zero cholesterol. Uh, <laughs> I love this one. Look at my new laptop, Adam. <laughs> I, I even have to laugh at this one. All right. Do the next one, please. Wait, is that genetically modified? <laughs> For all of you that are into health foods. All right. I think, this, is that it? Or we have one more? That's it. Okay. All right. Yeah. This little joke is called, uh, Will You Still Love Me? Ah, marriage, the man said. I was standing in front of the bathroom mirror one evening admiring my reflection. When I pose this question to my wife of 30 years, will you still love me when I'm old, fat, and balding? She answered, I do. <laughs> I'll just do one more and that's it. How many of you have an iPhone with Siri on it. You have Siri, right. This is called when Siri slips. <laughs> After I messaging back and forth with his wife, a husband jokingly commanded Siri to pass along this message. You need to get back to work now. You have a husband to support. Here's what Siri sent. You need to get back to work now. You have a husband to support. <laughs> I'll, I'll spare you the rest of them. <laughs> All right. Last week, we got up to the point where I described to you how, through the through his, history, through the historical setting of, of humanity, of how it came to pass in ancient days, civilization was affected by the Greek mentality. How many of you remember that from last week? That women were objects, that women were just uh, sexual partners to produce children, but they were to be kind of like slaves and be servants to men. That men were the superior human race, that women were to be subjected to men. And that, that whole influence dragged down through many civilizations, and actually it ended up in the first century when the church began. And the setting that I'm going to share with you tonight is now the Apostle Paul is writing, and if you recall, the main scripture that we read last week was from Galatians, where we talked about how in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, 
male nor female, bond or free, that all are one in Jesus Christ. How many of you remember that? And so here is Paul writing in a setting where the mentality, the, the, the mindset was women are secondary, women are objects, women are to be subjected or to subject themselves to their husbands. And so there's a whole new, a new Testament, new covenant understanding of this relationship. The lands that Alexander had Hellenized, the Apostle Paul now wanted to Christianize. And in order to do that, Paul had to tear down the walls that Greek culture and philosophy had solidified between people, including walls between men and women and husbands and wives. In Paul's gospel, a new order was going to be established in which all persons are one in Christ Jesus. Now, the relationship of Christian husbands and wives was to reflect the new model provided by the relationship of Christ and his church. And this is what we now call the Ephesians 5 syndrome. I want everybody to remember that. Say that out loud. Ephesians 5 syndrome. What in the world is that about? Well, when you open your Bible to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, you'll find out that that is the place where most men and husbands have used over the years to tell women that they are to subject themselves to them. And so we're going to deal with that tonight. How many would like me to deal with that tonight? Because if you don't want me to deal with that, I'm going to close my book and I'll go home and, uh, yeah, okay, stay right there, she said. I, I, I'll do that. So I want you to see that when this Greek or this New Testament was written, there is something that I need to, I don't want to get into the weeds of philosophy and, 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 and hermeneutics tonight, but I need to do it for a main purpose. Because when the New Testament was written, and when the, when the people in the days of Jesus were speaking what we call the Greek language, it was not the traditional dictionary Greek. It was something called koine. Now, that may not mean anything to you in a, in a you know, in a, what we call a, an educational sense, but you need to remember that because when you understand that, you'll understand that some of the words that were translated by the original 70 scholars that translated what we call the Septuagint or the Bible, they were translated in the traditional understanding of the Greek language. So some of the words were translated from words that did not exist in the original and how it was written. Are you all understanding that? The, the sad thing about uh, people that speak English is that we have one word for many meanings. How many know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Give you an example. For example, we have only one word for love, right? So you love your dog, you love your cat, you love your house, you love your car, you love your wife. What is the difference between them? What is the difference between them? There is a, listen, if you love your dog as much as you love your wife, you have a problem. If you love your house as much as you love your wife, you have a problem. And vice versa. You love your husband as much as you love your dog. I'm going to try this section here. Wow. Wow, I thought that would go over big. In the Greek language, you have different words for love. And even in, in, in other uh, romance languages or foreign languages, you have descriptive words that, dis that define things in a different way than we have words in English. So when you read certain words in your Bible, you have to remember that in order to understand them properly, you have to go back to its original meaning and how that was scripted and what it meant. Because if you don't do that, you'll find things in the Scripture and in the Bible that seemingly contradict one another. Yes, yes. Very important for you to understand that. This is, this is what we call hermeneutics, or things that describe how the Bible was written and what we call doctrine. Everybody say doctrine. Oh. Now, I told you I don't want to get into the weeds with this, so I'll try to do it as quickly as I can. In Ephesians chapter 5, notice what it says as we begin reading there in verse number, let's see, 21. Let's go back to verse 20. It says, giving thanks always for the things, for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you kindly read out loud verse 21? Please read it out loud. Ready? Read. Submitting yourselves 
one to another in the fear of God. Now everybody look up at me for a minute. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Everybody say that out loud. This is the general description of relationships in the body of Christ, period. Has nothing to do with male, female, or husbands and wives. It has to do with interrelationships between people. Submitting yourselves one to another. Everybody get it? All right. So now we're going to have to clear up that word submitting. It does not mean that for me to submit to you, I become a doormat that you walk on. Don't ever be fooled by somebody that comes to you and says, can I borrow $1,000 from you? And you say, absolutely not. And they say, well, you're my brother. You're my sister. You tell them, I'm a smart brother and a smart sister. I need a little help right there. Don't be fooled by some, uh, some uh, uh, sideshow circus person that wants to bilk you out of money or, or make you feel bad because they say, well, you're not acting in the love of God. No, the love of God knows how to choose between right and wrong. I'll deal with that in another uh, setting. But anyway, I want you to get that. All right, so now watch. Then the next verse says, wives... It doesn't say women. Oh, y'all didn't get that. It says, wives, s submit yourselves unto your... <laughs> oh, that, that needs a whole half hour just to describe that. Unto your own husband, not somebody else. Watch the next four words. As... Unto the Lord. Everything in your Bible is always written in that simile or comparison to how you treat God, you will always treat others. Man, if you never got another thing tonight, that would be enough to let you out of here to make you understand that our greatest relationship, our greatest problem in America today, it's, it's not a political problem, it's a sin problem. I, I'm going to have to have a little help here. The problem in marriage is not, listen, the problem in marriage when it goes wrong is a selfish problem. Selfishness rules in a marriage, it destroys it. And most of us will submit ourselves to one another as much as we are submitted to the Lord. If he is not the Lord of your life, there ain't no man or woman that's going to be. You're going to have a problem with everything else. You know why? Because you're going to adapt and adopt the philosophy of this world. You're going to adapt and adopt what people think and what people say who have no idea what that scripture says. Are you with me so far? So first of all, it's not saying that women are to subject themselves to men. It says wives are to what? Subject themselves to their own husbands. Now before you go crazy with that word subject, just hold it in abeyance because I'm going to clear it up for you in just a few minutes. And you're going to walk out of here happy face. <laughs> Turn to one of your girlfriends next to you and say, you're going to walk out of here with a happy face tonight. <laughs> okay, let's clear up. Let's, 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 let's read verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife. Oh, Jesus. I was with you, Pastor Dave, until you got to that verse. Why did you even, why did you even quote that verse? The husband is the head of the wife, okay? You obviously know I'm reading it to you because I'm going to clear it up for you. I'm going to show you that when it says the husband is the head of the wife, it doesn't mean he's the general and you're the sergeant. <laughs> 
Notice I didn't get an amen from the men in the back. <laughs> so the English translation, and I, I don't, listen, I don't have the time to keep going down until I get to another portion here, so stick with me, okay? The English translation notes, and it limits the, the understanding of how people are to treat one another. Just so you understand this, you might want to put this down in your note, and if you don't take notes, then you need to buy the CD. I'm serious. You need to hear it again. In this whole section on husbands and wives and relationship, there are 47 words directed at wives. There are 143 words directed at husbands. <laughs> Told you I was going to give you a happy face. Did you get that? If you did, say amen. amen. So let's look at the three key words that are in these verses. Number one, let's look at this word head. The husband is the head of the wife. Now, without, again, getting into the weeds, there, there's a translation of a word head from the Greek. It is the word arche, A-R-C-H-E. Okay? And that word literally means a general one in charge, like, uh, like, um, like the words for arch enemy or archangel or archbishop. It means somebody is in supreme control, okay? That's one of the translations or one of the words used for head. However, that's not the word that's used in the Koine Greek. Isn't that interesting, right? So here we are all these years thinking that the man is the one that rules the wife. Hey, where's my dinner? How come you didn't iron my pants? Did you wash my clothes? Does that sound like anything you've heard? <laughs> the word arche means magistrate, chief, prince, ruler, head. And, and, and it, that word head then becomes like a universal word to mean a supreme ruler who stands in command. And, has to, and when he says something, everybody else obeys. But Paul didn't use that word. He used the word K-E-P-H-A-L. The word does not mean head, like the part of one's body. It means something of like this. Let me explain it to you in, in the New Jersey translation, okay? <laughs> it means somebody, watch this now, who as a leader goes ahead and sticks his neck out for somebody behind him. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, y'all didn't hear that one. It means somebody who in the military is a leader by example so that everybody behind him or her follows his example in how to be somebody who takes the first step in protection for somebody behind him. Oh. oh, Jesus, help me. So any man that wants to be the head better be able to stick his neck out for his bride. Turn to somebody and say, I'm getting a happy face. And I can show you, without, again, getting into the weeds here, of how in the Septuagint was translated, they translated the word right. They would not translate the word from the, from the, in the Septuagint, these 70 translators, for, because they did not want to misuse the word to give authority to a man to make him a supreme ruler over a woman. Because they knew that that was not God's intention from day one. Are you understanding what I'm talking about? Like I said, we could get deep into this, and if we were in a classroom situation, we could examine the words on the board. We can't do that tonight. The second key, key words and phrase here is to be subject to. You notice that there in verse 21, be submitted, be submitted, be submitted. Subject to, subject to. Now, <laughs> how interesting this word becomes, because since kephale, which is the word I just gave you for a head, means one who sticks his neck out, does not mean ruler or convey any sense of leadership aside from the meeting the first into battle. 
that perhaps the word Paul used that is translated be subject to does not convey a sense of obedience. In fact, the use of that word in verse 21, be subject one to another, clearly demonstrates that it does not mean obedience for it would be impossible for a group of people to be obedient to each other as it would for a group to follow each other. That's a mouthful of words, but it's so important for you to hear. So, so in Greek, there is a word that means to obey. It can be translated be subject to, and it's a particular word that I'm not going to sp spell out to you. But that's not the word that was used. That, you, that word did not mean to obey or to be subject to it. didn't mean that there. There was another word that could be used for almost like the word RK, which was the ruler or the supreme commander. It describes obedience to someone who is in authority, but that's not the word that he used. He used another word, hupotasso, and that word is an interesting word because here is what that word symbolizes. Are you ready for this? I want you to say again, I'm ready for it. It means someone who is in a supportive role to somebody else, not by force, but by choice. I don't know. How many heard what I just said? So when it says be subject to, it's a, a woman who says, honey, if you want to go back to college, I'll support you. Okay, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to try, try this section. I had a little amen corner in here. Let me see if I can get some help. It's a woman who says, honey, I know you didn't get the job yet, but I'm, I'm supporting you. I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I'm talking about a man who legitimately looks. I'm not talking about a man who sits on his duff all day. Is that, can I use that word? Okay. Because I, I could have used another one. Well, that word's in the Bible. I'm talking about a person who is legitimately trying to do something to make their life better. So when it says be subject to, it actually is saying this. It is saying when a woman is supportive of her husband, she does everything she can to encourage him to make his destiny secure in him. It's not saying roll over, play dead. What a misuse of translated Greek words that people use to translate because that was their idea of what women were like. I, I just said a mouthful, man. I, I, if I'd ever said that in the Bible school that I was uh, taught in, they would have thrown me out the first day. Let me tell you something. You can make the Bible say anything you want it to say if you really want to do it. You know, I've said it before. That the key, the, 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 the favorite car of born-again Christians is the Honda. Because on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one accord. <laughs> yeah, come on now, come on. <laughs> or somebody who is into smoking. Oh, the favorite smoke is camel. Because Rebecca, when she saw Isaac, lighted off the camel. Crazy stuff. And people misuse things because they want to adapt things. And the scriptures were actually translated by words that were not used in the common, ordinary, daily Greek of Koine and were used in the traditional Greek. So instead of using the words that subjected, that didn't subject women to men, uh, or that, 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 that didn't subject women to men, they used words that did subject them because that was what the society they were born in was teaching them at that point. Wow. How disgusting is that? That somebody would use their own ideas to cause trouble among people for generations. Are you listening to what I'm saying? The third key word there is the word love. Now, everybody that knows anything about Greek knows there's three forms 
of Greek words that are used in the scripture. Eros, phileo, and agape. And the word that is used here, husbands, husbands, verse 25, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Let me tell you something. That is the tallest order in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. It, I hate to say this, but men have avoided that over the years of directing their attention to that. They have been on the husband's the head of the wife, be subject to the husband in all things, but never really quote, husbands, love your wives as, as, as Christ loved the church. If you read the rest of it, it will describe what it does. And who was willing to give himself for the church. Who laid down his life for the church. So agape conforms with that word stick your neck out. As the woman sticks, uh, as the man sticks his neck out for his wife. And as the woman choice, with a choice gives herself to her husband. And, 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 and wants to be that kind of a wife. The man earns that respect. By showing that woman the love that he has, that is the love of God, that is a love that never wants to take, it only wants to give. Oh, man. If you came only to hear this tonight, you would go home with enough. And if you're a single woman looking for a husband... You better look for the right one. Because if he treats you like a dog now, he's going to make you bark when you get married. <laughs> Any man that bosses you around, Puts his finger. Hey, submit yourself to me, woman. I'll give you an answer. Want to hear it? When you stick your neck out for me, you might get some respect. You're causing trouble in marriages. No, nah, I ain't causing trouble. I'm just identifying what's already there. Don't blame me for what mess you got in. Don't blame me for the mess you're in. I didn't cause it. I ain't in no mess. I ain't in no mess. I just tell her, put that dinner on the table right now. You hear me? No, I don't do that. Never do that. Never will. Never have. Never will. Never will. No, sir. No. Absolutely not. Because I, I would have no right standing here and preaching the Word of God if I cannot live what I am telling you to live. I would have no right in the world to do it. None. So let's get these words really put out. In, it. in fact, you know what I want to do? I want to read the translation of these words. Can I do that? So I can clear it up for you. I want to read Ephesians 5 now, translated from the way it should have been written in the first place. You ready for it? Here it is. Be supportive of one another. <laughs> I love that. Wives, be supportive of your husbands as of the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. That is, going ahead of her in the same way as Christ is the head of the church by being the savior of the body. But as the church is supportive of Christ, so let wives also be supportive of their husbands in everything. Husbands, be responsive to the needs of your wives as Christ has been to the church and gave himself up for her in order that he might make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in all glory without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and unblemished. So husbands, watch this, 
ought also to respond to the needs of their wives as to their own bodies. He who responds to the need of his own wife is responding to his own needs. Oh, my God. That's a simple definition. It means if I want to, watch this, if I want to treat myself right, I have to treat my wife right. You're not hearing me. I'm getting upset now. Because if two become one, it's not 50-50. That's the problem with a lot of marriages. They're 50-50. They're not 100%, 100%. Because if I want to treat myself right and we're one, I treat you the way I treat myself. So I don't buy $200 jeans for me and tell you to go shop in a bargain store. <laughs> Barbara, they treated me better last week. <laughs> I'm serious. Selfish men who buy things for themselves and don't treat their kids right. You don't, you, don't need, you don't need Jordan sneakers. And he's wearing $250 jeans with big holes in them. Are you going to help me or am I going to get... You ain't doing a good job. See? See? A man goes ahead sticks himself out there for his wife is a leader. You cannot trust someone, oh my God, this is a big mouthful, who leads from behind. I have to say this. Don't ever judge somebody when they're sleepy, though. I got to tell you a little story. <laughs> when we were living in Edison, um, it was a summer night. And I'm a sound sleeper. My wife is not a sound sleeper. And so she wakes me up. And she says, I think there's a noise downstairs. <laughs> and I just rolled over to the other side. And she <laughs> poked me again. She's like, I, I think there's a noise downstairs. And in that sleepiness, I said, well, why don't you go down and find out what it is? <laughs> You'd be nice then. And, and I, and she said, that's your job. I said, why don't you send the dog down? What a... What a man of faith and power, right, bros? <laughs> That's why I said, don't judge me when I'm sleepy, you know. No, a man is supposed to be a leader. A man is supposed to be a leader. We've got a little dog now. Her name is Daisy Mae. Uh, it's our little girl. And sometimes, you know, we, we live on a farm. So sometimes when my wife takes the dog out at night, she said, w w would you come down and... and down the stairs and, and watch me when I go out. I heard a funny noise out there. Yes, honey. Okay. Can I watch you from the window? <laughs> watch. Watch. So when you interpret these scriptures, these scriptures give no man or male the right to usurp over a woman. They are mutually attached to each other that one has to be, to be a leader, you have to earn your stripes. You have to stick your neck out. And when you do, 
your wife becomes supportive of you. That is, if you're not lazy man, you know. I'm getting in trouble now. I love you, brothers. I love you, brothers. I love you. Now, why do we have to go through these scriptures? Because if everything the Apostle Paul was doing, now you got to get this. If everything the Apostle Paul was doing throughout his ministry with women, the way he supported women and the way women were involved in his ministry and in his life, to have written something like this that would have made women subjected to men would have been completely opposite of what he now was doing in his personal life. Did anybody understand what I just said? And I'm going to show you tonight how women were involved in his ministry, how they were a part of his ministry, how at certain times, women became the leaders in his ministry. Yes, somebody ought to say glory to God. Somebody ought to say amen. Somebody ought to tap the person next to him that's trying to get excited at me and say, stop it. Man's trying to teach us something. 